Uh, okay, uh, dear friends, welcome back to the Tsinghua University's Global Open Courses, uh, the National Parks and Protected Areas in China. Um, today is the lecture uh, six. I'm Cao Yue from Department of Landscape Architecture, and I will talk about nature conservation in wilderness areas of China, or in short, wilderness conservation of China. Uh, so first of all, let's uh, review the structure of the course uh, together. Uh, we had an introduction to national parks and protected areas at the first lecture, and then three pr professors uh, introduced the main types of protected areas in China, including the national parks, uh, delivered by Professor Zhao Zhicong, uh, nature reserves of China, delivered by Professor Liu Xiehua, and also scenic areas and world natural heritages by Professor Zhong Yubo. So that's the first section of this course. So after this course, you will get a whole a basic idea on China's protected area system. But you know, uh, protected areas only take up to about 20% of the land area. So what about the other 80%? Biodiversity exists in all terrestrial areas. So that we designed the second uh, part of this course is about nature conservation in all terrestrial areas of China. And today is the first lecture in this part. It's about nature conservation in wilderness areas. And the next week, Professor Yu Le will introduce nature conservation in agricultural areas. And Professor Yang Jun will uh, discuss urban biodiversity conservation. So for today's lecture, we have three parts. The first part is about defining and valuing wilderness areas. So we will discuss what is wilderness and why are they important. And the second part is about mapping wilderness areas. And at this part, I will introduce uh, our research at three special scales, from the global to national and to local scale. And at the third part, we'll discuss about uh, how to conserve these areas. So basically, it's from uh, what is wilderness area and where are they and how to protect them. So uh, before introducing the definition of wilderness areas, I would like to uh, recommend some books for you. I strongly recommend you to read these books if you are interested in nature. So uh, the first one uh, is called Nature. Written by uh, Emerson. So it's not a very long book, but very interesting, and his argument is very strong and inspiring. And the second part, uh, second book is the uh, Walden. I think this is more famous, and our uh, head of the university has also recommended this book several years ago. And two books from John Muir. Uh, John Muir is, the, is called the father of national parks in the United States, or the son of wilderness. And in these two books, you will uh, know his experience when he walked into the wild in the United States, so including our national parks and my first summer in the Sierra. And then uh, a Sand County Almanac, written by uh, Leopold. This is a very important book in the field of uh, environmental ethics, because he discussed the concept of land ethics to discuss how could we deal with the relationship between man and the land. And the next one, the Silent Spring, I think is even much more famous uh, because uh, this is very important in uh, environmental protection. And if you are uh, interested in wilderness in particular, I rec recommend you to read Wilderness and the American Mind uh, by Roderick Nash. So uh, after reading this book, you will know the whole history of uh, wilderness conservation in the United States. And if you are interested in philosophy, I recommend you to read Philosophy Gone Wild, written by Rolston. And these are all uh, English books, but they all have Chinese uh, editions. And another two Chinese books I strongly recommend is written by Professor Cheng Hong, and he, uh, she is an expert in nature writing. 
So Xun uh, Gui Huang Ye and the Ning Jing Wu Jia. It's very um, interesting books. So after reading these books, you will get some ideas of what is wilderness and why are they important. And besides reading books, I think uh, you may also find some opportunities to go into the real wilderness. And these are some photos I, take, I took uh, in my field trips in the wilderness in the past few years. The first row is some places in China. So you could see uh, Mount Xiaowutai, Mount Wuyi, Mount Huang in the eastern part, and also the uh, Yellow River source in the western part of China. And the second row is the national parks and uh, some wilderness I visited in uh, outside China, including some national parks in the UK and the United States, and also Israel. So after uh, you go into these places, you will get a deeper understanding of wilderness. And uh, you know, as I'm an architect before, so I will uh, draw some paintings when I uh, visit the park. So these are some uh, photos or wildlife you could see in the uh, Three River Source National Park. I think uh, Professor Zhao Zhicong has already introduced this national park very comprehensively. OK, so uh, let's start from a short group discussion first. What is wilderness, and have you ever been to any wilderness areas which impressed you the most? I will give you two minutes, and you can discuss with your classmates. And uh, friends online, you could just think about this question. OK, please start. You could speak out. Okay, I think uh, you will have your own answer and let's uh, discuss the definition. So uh, we can, uh, if we look at a map, we can see the process that how human beings change the land cover and the land use. So uh, before human beings exist, all the world is uh, you know, full of wildlife, no human beings, we could call it uh, pristine wilderness. And after, uh, especially the Industrial Revolution, uh, human beings changed the land cover significantly. So that's a process of wilderness exploitation, or you could call it development. Uh, and it's a kind of destroy of the wilderness. So uh, after this process, wilderness only existed in a fragmented way. But also there are some places that exist uh, the process of wilderness restoration, or we call it rewilding. So it means uh, uh, some areas begin to recover because human impact uh, disappear in this region. So these two processes are all about uh, wilderness. And at least three classic definitions of wilderness here, including the definition in the United States, and the Europe, and also proposed by the IUCN. So uh, if you look at the definition, you could find some common characters that how they define wilderness. So first of all, the most important one is that these regions are unmodified or slightly modified or uncontrolled by the human beings. And the second point is that these regions is retaining their natural character and the composed of native habitats and species. And the third uh, point is that these regions should be large enough. So uh, only when it is large enough, it can uh, contain an ecosystem that has the highest level of ecosystem integrity and authenticity. And uh, specifically in the United States, they have a 
criteria for wilderness that a wilderness should be at least 5,000 acres. So that's about 20 square kilometers, 20 square kilometers. So if Tsinghua's campus is four square kilometers, so that means five, uh, five Tsinghua campus. So that's the minimum size of uh, designated wilderness in the United States. And we could uh, define wilderness using a continuum, the concept of continuum, because wilderness is uh, not about black or white. Uh, for example, we say this is a wilderness, that is not. So that's a kind of a black or white concept. But actually, uh, human development is on a continuum. So we could define wilderness on a continuum. So from the uh, highest level of human modification, that is urban areas. And then we have uh, intensive uses and agricultural areas. And then we have the, uh, when the remoteness and naturalness increase, we will has, have the higher wilderness quality. So wilderness is, sits on one extreme of this continuum. And another question is, why are these regions important? Uh, I will give two uh, case studies, the research from the research uh, saying why they are important. The first one uh, is about the importance of wilderness to biodiversity or the species. So a paper published in Nature in 2019 called Wilderness Areas Half the Extinction Risk of Terrestrial Biodiversity. They found that global probability of species extinction in non-wilderness communities is over twice as high as that of species in wilderness communities. So that means wilderness areas, because they, are, uh, they have lower level of human impact, they could act as a buffer to the species loss. So that's why wilderness is important for biodiversity. But this conclusion is, uh, you know, have some limitations, limited to the data they use, the method they use, and also the, the scale they uh, conducted the analysis, so it's at a global scale. So, uh, so we can have idea that wilderness is uh, important to biodiversity, but this conclusion may vary across scales and uh, depend on what data and method we use. Besides the importance to uh, the biodiversity or the wildlife, they are also important to human beings, especially in the aspects of public health. So uh, we all know COVID-19 is a kind of zoonotic uh, disease. And another paper published in Nature last year called Zoonotic Host Diversity Increases in Human Dominated Ecosystems. So they find that non-wildlife hosts of human shared pathogens and parasites overall comprise a greater proportion of local species richness and total abundance in sites under substantial human use. This includes the secondary agricultural and urban ecosystems, compared with the nearby undisturbed habitats, or in other words, we can uh, understand the undisturbed habitats as wilderness. So uh, this paper means that uh, if human beings change the land cover from a pristine or natural land cover into agricultural urban ecosystem. It will increase the opportunity that human beings contact with these pathogens and parasites. So protecting the remaining wilderness also benefits a lot to public health for the human society and maybe prevent the uh, future pandemic. So that's uh, the importance of wilderness in terms of uh, public health. So these are only two uh, examples that uh, occurred in the scientific research. And we could have a more comprehensive understanding framework to explain why wilderness is important. So I will list three points here. The first one is about the intrinsic value of nature. So in Chinese, we call it nei zai jia zhi. So that means uh, there is a growing appreciation of intrinsic value of nature those values unique to wilderness itself and beyond any human evaluation connection. So uh, in nowadays, we, uh, when we talk about nature conservation, 
we uh, use the concept of uh, natural capital or ecosystem services to illustrate why nature is important for human beings. It's because they are useful to human beings. But another point is that many people think that protecting nature is protecting nature itself, not because nature can benefit human beings, so we call that important. So uh, this is, is the intrinsic value of nature and also the importance of respecting and protecting the diversity on the whole earth. And the second point is ecosystem services, which we talk uh, more in uh, nowadays. So that means uh, the ecosystems in the wilderness areas, they provide the services and products that human beings depend on. For example, the fresh water, uh, for example, uh, protected area or national park near an uh, urban area, they will provide the fresh water to the urban residents. And also carbon sequestration in some forest landscapes, which is important to uh, mitigate the climate change. And also it is closely linked to and depend on biodiversity and ecological integrity. And the third point is also very important. May some people may ignore this, is that uh, wilderness also have high cultural and linguistic diversity. That is mean uh, many indigenous peoples and local communities that live in wilderness as a very uh, pristine uh, lifestyle or near the boundary of the wilderness. So protecting these regions is also protecting cultural diversity. So realization that destroying wilderness areas in many cases means losing the incredible cultural and linguistic, linguistic diversity in these areas. And uh, related to point three, I want to emphasize that uh, wilderness areas do not exclude people. Rather, they exclude certain human uses, in particular industrial uses. For example, the expansion of human settlements or building a road, mechanized roads, so uh, which are inconsistent or uh, you know, re reducing the wilderness values. So that's a very important point that uh, some people may ignore. And that is also mean that wilderness has a relationship with the human beings. So the relationship can, on one uh, aspect includes many indigenous peoples and tribes live in these areas, but also includes the rural and urban residents seeking solitude, recreation, or other human benefits in these regions. So uh, that's very important. Wilderness is not a no man's land, or wilderness is not a place that do not have any connection with human beings. So I want to emphasize that uh, this point is very important. OK. Uh, we spent 20 minutes on the definition, and we will spend another 20 minutes on mapping wilderness areas. So uh, after we know what is wilderness, we need to find out where are they located on the map. So I will provide three research conducted by our team at global, national, and regional scales. So these three maps, the first one is uh, at the global scale, so it's the low impact areas or low human impact areas in the uh, conservation priority zones for biodiversity conservation. Actually, I have mentioned this case in the first lecture, so I will uh, not go into detail today, but I will show you the global distribution of wilderness. And the second case is about mapping wilderness in China at the national scale. So we uncover the special distribution of wilderness areas in China. And then at the regional scale, we take Great Taihang Mountains, Taihang Shan, as a case study to model a wilderness network. That means to connect the fragmented wilderness patches in eastern China. So uh, these three maps is about mapping wilderness areas and to tell the public where the wilderness areas located in. So the first case uh, is the low impact areas in conservation priority zones. So you may know that the conservation priority zones is combined or uh, 
by the seven templates, which is important for biodiversity. And we combine conservation priority zones with the low impact areas to identify the cost effective zones for protected area designation. And then we propose the protected areas target for each country. So in this research, we used a data uh, from Jack Bison, and uh, he has mapped the global areas of human impact. Actually, there are uh, several uh, products at global scale to uncover the distribution of buildings areas, but they have some uh, difference because of the quality of the data and the method they use. And we think this map is more suitable in our research, so we use this one. So if you look at this map, uh, they find that about half of the planet is low impact areas. So although, uh, I don't know whether you think this number is high or low, uh, but different uh, research will give different conclusions, but I think this is acceptable because uh, even when human population dominates the world, you know, the urban areas is uh, relatively small. Uh, if you look at the land cover map at the global scale. So the region with the color are the low impact areas they, they find. So you could see um, it exists in every continent and from uh, and, uh, in every biomes or eco regions. And we could see that uh, China is a mega wild country, which means China also uh, have large area of wilderness areas. But you know, at the global scale, because of the limitation of data quality, we still need to map the buildings at the national scale and regional scales. So we propose the question that where are the buildings areas in China? And we establish a GIS model to answer this question. And we have two methods which is more suitable to China. So if you look at the left hand, we use a method called Boolean overlay to identify the wilderness patches. And this is a kind of concept of black or white. So we distinguish all the land into two types, wild or non-wild. And we use three criteria to identify the wilderness areas. The first is that wilderness areas should contain only natural land cover. And the second is that the wilderness areas should be roadless. So uh, it's beyond the Im impact zones of all levels of mechanized roads. And also the third point is that wilderness areas should be free from permanent human settlements. So after uh, we use the, these three criteria and the data, we could find which area is wild, which one is not wild. But uh, as I mentioned, wilderness is a concept of continuum. So we also used a method on the right hand, which is called a weighted linear combination. So we used six indicators to identify the wild quality of all uh, terrestrial area. So uh, this is the result of the first method. It's about wilderness patches in China. And we find that there are over 86,000 wilderness patches. And they are identified by, by this research. And uh, they comprise approximately 42% of China's terrestrial area. So if you look at the map, the color region is the wild areas we uh, identified. So it's mainly uh, distributed in the western China. And in western China, the wilderness patches are large and connected with the other patches. But in the eastern part, the wilderness patches are relatively small and also fragmented, highly fragmented. And uh, about the second method, we use uh, wilderness indicators. The first one is biophysical naturalness of land use. So how natural is the land cover or the land use? And then we use population density. So that means if uh, population density is high, the wilderness quality is low. And also we use remoteness from settlements and roads, railways, and also settlements density and uh, roads, railway density. So they, they can reflect the wilderness quality of a certain region. 
And we uh, combine these six maps together using the weights from an expert survey. So we could see the results. This map is the combination of the six indicators. So that's a continuum, right? So it's from red to blue, and red part is the areas with the lowest level of, hu of wilderness quality or the highest level of human impact. And the blue part is the regions having highest level of wilderness quality or low level of uh, human impact. So you could see a similar pattern with the previous map, but this map will show more details in terms of the continuum. And if we look at Beijing, for example, uh, this is the center of Beijing, where we are now, and it's very, you know, highest level of human impacts. But in the mountain regions, in the west of Beijing, there are still some regions that have relatively high wilderness quality compared to the urban regions. And that's why, we, you know, in the weekends, we could have some opportunities to climb the mountains in Beijing. So Beijing also have some wilderness patches. And we could combine the uh, wilderness patch map and with the continuum map together. So we could call it integrated wilderness map. So this map shows the boundary of the patches, but also evaluate the relative or average uh, wilderness quality of these maps. So uh, we could think about uh, what uh, are the potential applications of these maps. What uh, they can be uh, applied to nature conservation uh, in China. Especially uh, combined with the national policy of China, for example, the special planning or establishing a national park system, a protected area system, or a ecological red line or something, uh, ecological restoration. So uh, these maps could be used in these regions because it reflects the human impact. And human impact is a very basic uh, information for many analysis and the practice. And I will give an example at the regional scale that we, how we use the map from the national scale. Uh, this uh, study is conducted uh, in the background that we can uh, see from the map that, you know, Hu line, right? Hu Huan Yung line, Hu Huan Yung Xian is a very uh, important geographic line proposed by the Chinese geographer Hu Huan Yung. So uh, on the west side of the Hu line, population density is very low, and uh, in the eastern part, population density is very high. And uh, this also is important for wilderness because in the eastern part of Hu line, the wilderness areas are relatively small and fragmented, so they need to be connected. Otherwise, the species will extinct or lost in these fragmented wilderness patches. So that's why wildland network planning is important. And we try to model this uh, network uh, in Taihang Mountains as a case study. Uh, so why? Uh, we have done this research is because you know there's a very famous Chinese NGO which is called Chinese uh, uh, Fatted Conservation Aliens or Mao Meng, Zhongguo Mao Kedong Baohu Lian Meng. So they protect the big cats in China, and uh, actually uh, you know historically North Chinese leopards they exist in the mountains of Beijing, but because of human uh, destroy of the natural habitats. They uh, disappeared in Beijing, but they also, but they still exist in the Taihang regions, in Shanxi province and in Hebei province. So uh, Mao Meng uh, launched a project called Bring Leopards Home. In Chinese, we call it Dai Bao Hui Jia. So they aim to rewild or restore the leopard habitat along the great Taihang regions. And uh, it say that imagine that one day from the Great Wall to the Yellow River, leopards could roam among the whole Taihang Mountains. What a nature wonder it could be in Eastern China. So uh, protecting leopards is about protecting the ecological integrity of the ecosystem. So it's not about only protect a certain species, but also protect the whole mountain 
or the whole natural ecosystem, which will, you know, provides many products and services to human beings. So uh, only a leopard exists, you can call it an ecosystem with high level of ecological integrity, or the ecosystem is health, in a healthy state. So what we have done uh, is to propose a framework to model the wildland network. You know, to, uh, I will draw some paintings, paintings here. So the, in eastern China, the wilderness patches are you know, very small and also fragmented. So that means uh, there are very, uh, a lot of uh, roads or the human settlements uh, across these regions. So if a species or a or species like a leopard, they need a very large, very large habitat. So they, they, they need to uh, go across the roads. Uh, so very, it's very important to uh, connect these regions. So that means uh, we need to model and uh, construct some ecological corridors between these uh, patches so that uh, they are connected together and the animals, the wildlife can roam from one patch to the other. So that's uh, called connectivity conservation, which is very important in uh, today's nature conservation. So that's why we uh, propose a network to model this wildland network. And our study region, you know, is very large from uh, the south of Shanxi province uh, to Beijing. So a very large region from the Yellow River to the Great Wall. And there are many leopards exist in these mountain regions. And the first step, we need to identify the core areas. That means the target areas that we need to connect. And then we need to create a resistant service. So resistant service means that uh, how easy or how hard for a wildlife to move in a landscape. So uh, in this study, we think resistant service is related to wilderness quality. Because if a region has high, higher wilderness quality, that means it has lower human impact and it's much easier for the wildlife to move across these regions. So actually there is a relationship between the resistance and the wilderness quality. And we created different scenarios, four scenarios of resistance service. And because we have three core types and uh, four resistance surfaces, we could um, have uh, 12 scenarios uh, the scenario planning for the wildland network. So uh, you can see uh, in the right uh, figure, the, uh, you could see the ecological corridors we identified between these uh, patches. And within the ecological corridors we model, we also identify the pinch points. In Chinese, we call it or So that means uh, the important regions we need to conduct ecological restoration projects. So in these regions, if we, uh, for example, build a bridge across the ro roads, uh, it ha will have a high probability that the animals could move or use this uh, ecological infrastructure. So pinch points are the area with high cumulative current values. We use a circuit theory here, and most important to connectivity, conservation, and restoration. So uh, that's the three case studies I, I will introduce about mapping wilderness areas at global, national, and regional scale. And I will also talk about some related concepts which are very interesting. Uh, so how do human activities affect the rivers, the ocean, the sky, and the soundscape, besides affecting the, you know, the terrestrial land surfaces. So that means uh, the four concepts are very important. The first one is free flowing rivers. So the rivers that are not uh, destroyed, the connectivity is not destroyed by human beings or the dams. 
And a global map shows that only about 37% of the rivers at the global scale could be seen as free flowing rivers. And they may mainly distributed in Antarctica, Beiji, Amazon, uh, Yamashu, and Congo basins, Gangwo Pendi. So you could see, uh, especially uh, the China part, uh, actually China has very uh, low percent of free flowing rivers because we built a lot of dams uh, on these rivers. And my colleague, uh, Professor Liu Hailong in the Department of Landscape Architecture at Tsinghua University also mapped the free flowing rivers in China at the global scale. And they find that only 6.85% of the rivers could be seen as the potential free flowing rivers. So in China, the percentage of free flowing rivers is lower than the global average situation. And the second related concept is marine wilderness, because uh, the maps we created is all about uh, terrestrial wilderness. But actually, ocean is also impacted by different types of human activities. So the concept of marine wilderness or ocean wilderness is also important for ocean biodiversity conservation. And a research found that only about 17% uh, of the world's ocean could be seen as marine wilderness. So that means uh, in the ocean areas, human activities is also very high, it's beyond our imagination. And among these marine wilderness, only less than 5% is located in protected areas. So there's an obvious conservation gap about ocean or marine wilderness. And the second related concept is uh, called night skies. So uh, I, th I think everyone has maybe some opportunities to see the stars or the night skies, uh, sometimes even in the urban areas, but it's not, uh, it's not good. You can only see very good night skies in the rural areas or the wild areas. So night sky is the sky free from light pollution at night. This is a photo taken by Wang Luyuan, and uh, she's sitting in the classroom. And a global analysis finds that about 83% of the world's population, human population, live under light polluted skies. So that means uh, in our daily life, about uh, more than 80% of the residents, they cannot see a real night sky. So um, I think that's maybe harmful for the human society. And uh, Professor Zhong Le from uh, Huazhong Agricultural University has conducted analysis uh, on the relationship between China's protected areas and night skies. So from his findings, we can, see, we can say that if you want to see a real night sky, you need to go into the protected areas or go out of the urban or rural areas. So in the, uh, you know, the national parks, pilot areas, and other types of protected areas, the quality of night skies is higher than other regions. And the fourth uh, related concept is natural quiet. We call it ziran uh, jijing or ziran ningjing. And uh, my friend, Professor Xu Xiaoqing in Tongji University has conducted some uh, mapping research at the protected area level to identify the natural quiet uh, within a protected areas and uh, to discuss how should we manage or conserve these natural quiet as uh, valuable resources. So actually noise pollution is harmful not only to wildlife but also to human beings. So protecting natural quiet is also an uh, important issue in many uh, national parks and protected areas around the world. So that's four related concepts uh, relevant to wilderness areas. And that's the second part we discussed the mapping wilderness areas to uncover the special distribution of these regions at global, national, and regional scales. And we discussed the free flowing rivers, the ocean marine wilderness, and also the night skies and also the natural quiet. 
So uh, after we know their location, we need to discuss how could we conserve or protect them. So in the second part, I will talk about conserving wilderness areas. And I will use uh, three case studies. The first one is the United States, and the second is Europe. And we'll discuss a uh, little bit about how to conserve wilderness areas in China. So uh, actually there is an international wilderness conservation movement. So it's beyond uh, one single country because as you could see from the global wilderness map, it exists in every continent and biomes, ecoregions. And from a guideline published by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, there are 48 countries have wilderness areas established by well, legislative designation as the IUCN-1B uh, category size, and they are not overlapped with the other categories. And besides these 48 countries, there are 23 uh, other countries uh, that have wilderness areas established by administrative designation or wilderness zones within protected areas. So in these countries, although they don't have uh, sites identified as category 1B, wilderness protected areas, but they have a zone within the protected areas or national parks to protect the wilderness quality. And uh, that's the global big picture. And uh, I will talk about the United States first, because you know, um, in the modern uh, perspective, wilderness conservation originated in this country and spread, these ideas spread to the other countries. So uh, this, uh, some years before, I have visited the National uh, Wilderness Preservation System and talked with the land management agencies at the uh, central government level, including the National Park Service and also the uh, National Forest uh, Agency. So uh, actually, uh, even in the United States, they experience a very severe uh, destroy of wilderness before they start to notice the value of wilderness or start to protect wilderness. So, uh, you know, uh, in the Americans' history, there is a very big movement called westward expansion, Xijin Yundo. So when they found the new continent, they start from the east coast to uh, develop uh, to the west coast. So in this process, they destroyed a lot of wilderness and the wildlife, and also Indian cultural. So the local uh, cultural and uh, biological diversity are destroyed uh, to a very severe uh, degree because of these uh, new uh, settlers. But in this process, some figures, very important figures, started to notice the value and the importance of wilderness conservation, you know, including George Cartling, Emerson, Thoreau, John Muir, Aldo Leopold, and Bob Marshall. So after they, uh, because of their efforts, the United States published a Wilderness Act in 1964. So this is a first national law of wilderness preservation around the world, and this law established a system called National Wilderness Preservation System in the United States. And actually, uh, I think many uh, scholars in China are very familiar with the national park system in the United States. Uh, well, we know uh, less about the National Wilderness Preservation System. But actually, these two systems have a very strong connection or overlap so the National Wilderness Preservation System and the National Park System, they have a very high level of overlap. So if we look at the NWPS, the National Wilderness Preservation System, we can see it is managed by four uh, agencies, including the National Park Service, the Forest Service, the Fish and the Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Land Man Management. And in these four agencies, the National Park Service manage about 40% of the lands in NWPS. So that means in the NWPS, there are 40% of the land are managed by the National Park Service. 
And if we look at the National Park Service, if we look at the, uh, there are 423 individual units in the National Park Service in the United States. And in the lands that National Park Service manage, there are about 52%. Uh, they also belong to the NWPS. So that means about over a half of the lands in the National Park uh, Service managed, they, also, they are also designated as a wilderness conservation sites. So they also belong to NWPS. So these two numbers shows that there is a very high uh, level of overlap between the National Wilderness Preservation System and the National Park uh, System. So that means wilderness plays a very important role in national parks and the protected areas. And if we look at the continental scale, if we look beyond a uh, country, uh, the United States, we could uh, see there's a project called North America Wellland Network. So it's a very large continental scale conservation project that's including the United States, the Canada, and also Mexico. And they emphasize three elements. The core wild areas, which has the highest uh, level of uh, ecological integrity, and also connectivity that I have also uh, discussed here, the connect connectivity, and also carnivores, the top predators in the uh, ecosystem food webs. And they promote uh, four continental wildways, so you could understand it as ecological corridors or ecological networks, so including the Eastern, Western Pacific wildway and also the Mexico program. So that's a very large scale pr protection. You could imagine, can we pr propose a project from you know, Heilongjiang to Hainan. So that's the very big scale conservation. Okay, that's the situation in the United States. Let's talk about uh, the situation in Europe. Uh, actually, you know, Europe is a continent that has a very high level of human impact because it has a much longer history and has a lot of cultural heritages and cultural landscapes. Uh, almost uh, nowhere that human beings do not exist. So uh, is the concept of wilderness useful to Europe? Because you know, the con context is very different from the United States. But actually, uh, in recent years, the European countries start to notice the value of their remaining wilderness areas, although you know, very less exist. So in 29, the European wilderness resolution is passed. So that means at the European level, they uh, recognize the value of wilderness areas. And uh, they also created a guideline on wilderness conservation in the Natural 2000. Natural 2000 is the protected area system in Europe. And uh, they want to promote uh, conservation of wilderness in their protected area system. And also there are many NGOs, for example, promoting a European wilderness network. And they propose uh, different uh, categories, you know, because the diversity of wild ecosystems. So they propose the wild islands, the wild forest, the wild coast, and the wild river. So this is related to the concept such as the free flowing rivers and also marine wilderness. And they proposed 10 principles that a wilderness areas should satisfy. So uh, when they identify the wilderness areas, it should uh, uh, consider a lot of indicators that these regions should satisfy. And after the assessment, they classify their wilderness into different types. They call it uh, bronze, silver, gold, and the platinum uh, wilderness. So uh, if you have a high uh, wilderness quality, you may be listed as a gold or platinum wilderness. So that means uh, they use different classification systems to recognize the different levels of wilderness quality. Actually, this is you know, very suitable for Europe because, uh, as I mentioned, very few real and intact large wilderness exist in Europe. So. Uh, they could use this kind of classification system to recognize 
know, some very small patches of wilderness areas. So if you look at the human footprint index of uh, Europe, so this map shows the human impact level. So the red part is areas with very high level of human intervention, disturbance, or human footprint. So you could see the wild areas only exist in North Europe and Iceland. So uh, is wilderness the concept useful for the continental Europe? So that's a question they are thinking and discussing. So that's why they also propose a European rewilding network because they have less wild, so they want to create more, and they want to restore the native ecosystems that have been destroyed by the human activities. So they want to make Europe a wider place, and with more space for wild nature. And that's at the European level, and I will give two uh, cases at the country level. So the first one is Scotland. Scotland is at the north of the United Kingdom, and you know the highlands, the landscape is extremely beautiful. And uh, this is a photo I took in the Crefin wild, Wildwood in Scotland. And in Scotland, uh, they protect about 20% of their terrestrial a areas as wildland. And this includes 42 wildlands, and for each wildland, they have a very specific and clear special boundary and the descriptive documents to document the basic information and the value of these regions. So you may notice that uh, they uh, do a lot of conservation work because they designate about 20% of their total ter terrestrial area as the wildland. And they use the, wild, the term wildland rather than wilderness. So that's also uh, to suit the context in their own country. And another case is in Germany. You know, Germany is also uh, a highly densely populated country. So uh, very few or nearly no wilderness exist in this country. But in their biological diversity conservation plan, they propose that this country should achieve a 2% of the national land be designated as large-scale wilderness areas. So this is an ambitious target for their country, but they think it's achievable, and they are making efforts to achieve this uh, goal. Because you know, in a country, if uh, there is no wild, the public will be eager to create more wild nature in their daily life, because uh, it could provide many uh, benefits for example, especially the health benefits to the human beings in the modernized uh, world. And uh, we will briefly uh, discuss how to protect China's wilderness because we could see the experience in the United States and Europe. Actually, China, I think, is like a, a combination of United States and Europe because in Western China, is a more, actually in Western China, there are some places, the wilderness areas is even higher, or is higher than all of the wild areas in, in the United States, because we still have, for example, Qiangtang, there's uh, very large and intact wilderness areas. And uh, if you look at the global wilderness map, you could see Qiangtang as the global scale, but you could see, you couldn't see any patches in, in the United States. So in Western China, we have some regions that have higher wilderness quality than all of the landscapes in the United States. But in Eastern China, it's more like Europe because uh, we have even more higher population density and human impacts than Europe. So it's a kind of combination of United States and Europe. And uh, if we overlay the wilderness patches map with the nature reserve in China, we could find that about 80% of the existing wilderness areas in China are not covered by na nature reserves. So that means uh, obvious conservation gaps of wilderness areas. Although not, you know, not all of the wilderness areas should be included in the protected areas, but it still shows a great uh, potential that our protected areas could expand and to protect more wildlands. 
So how to protect China's wilderness? Uh, I listed uh, several problems uh, in China's wilderness conservation. The first one is insufficient awareness of wilderness values. So we need to uh, re-recognize and revalue the regions that have lower human impact in our you know, different levels of policies at the national provincial levels. And insufficient wilderness investigation. Although we have a very initial wilderness map, but we do not have the basic information and the values uh, they have. So uh, still, a lot of investigation and research need to be conducted. And the third point, and the most important point, is that there's still obvious wilderness conservation gaps. So, uh, but that also shows that we still have a large potential or opportunities to expand our protected area system to cover more wilderness areas. And the fourth po the four point is that the severe fragmentation of wilderness areas, especially in eastern China. So as I uh, illustrated in the Taihang Mountains, you could see, uh, and also you could you know, go into this place and you could find that uh, a lot of roads, a lot of human settlements that are separating the integrity of wilderness areas. And the last one is that the management quality or government's quality quality could be improved. So mainstreaming an inventory and comprehensive hierarchical conservation, connectivity conservation, and management quality improvement are the strategies that we could use to protect China's wilderness areas. And uh, we have overlaid the special boundary of, you know, we have five national parks in China now, the first bunch including the three river source, the Northeast China and Leopard National Park, the Hainan Tropical Rainforest National Park, the Giant Panda National Park, and Mount Wei National Park, with the wilderness quality map, where you could also overlay it with the wilderness patches map. You could find that, for example, in Hainan, uh, the blue shows the higher wilderness quality. So that means uh, the national park we, we designated, you know, has already protect the regions that have higher uh, wilderness quality. So that means, uh, you know, the boundary is relatively reasonable uh, in this case. But you could also see some uh, blue parts which have high wilderness quality that is located outside the national parks. So basically, I think uh, we could uh, conduct work in two aspects. The first is to promote wilderness conservation in the protected area system and the, in the existing national parks, nature reserves and nature parks to uh, you know, identify the wilderness areas in these regions and to promote the uh, management quality. And the other point is also very important is that outside the protected areas we need to conserve more and restoring more wilderness areas. Okay, so uh, that's uh, today's lecture. Uh, if we do a summary, we have discussed the definition and value of national park uh, of wilderness areas, and we use three uh, scales research to illustrate how to map wilderness areas, and we discuss wilderness conservation in the United States, in Europe, and in China. And uh, before uh, closing this uh, lecture. I would uh, recommend the books again. So uh, I hope you could you know, take a photo or take a note. These 10 books are really uh, very interesting and very inspiring books if you are interested in nature conservation. And also because the limited time, I, I could not uh, go into details of each case and you could read some papers that uh, will have more information uh, produced by our team. Okay, uh, that's today's lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.